In 1986, astronomer Clifford Stoll used a 75-cent billing discrepancy to bring down an entire spy ring. At the time, Cliff was working as an astronomer, but his grant had recently run out, and the Berkeley lab had hired him as a computer specialist. The computers at Berkeley were used mostly by physicists and astronomers, and the time that was used on those computers was billed hourly. At the end of Clifford's first month, his boss came to him and said, for the first time in the existence of this system, we've got a 75 cent discrepancy. Now these labs billed several thousand dollars every month. It was $300 per hour to use these computers, but they were so confident in their own accounting software that they knew the discrepancy had to be coming from somewhere else. For the sake of due diligence at his new job anyway, Cliff Stoll runs a few diagnostics, everything comes back clean, there's nothing wrong with the accounting software. So the next thing he does is he begins scrolling through the list of approved users and he finds one named Hunter with no account number. No account number means they can't bill you, so Cliff just deletes the user and thinks that's the end of it. The very next morning, they get an email from another computer lab in Maryland that says, hey, someone from your computer lab keeps trying to break into our system. If you could make it so that doesn't happen anymore, we'd really appreciate it. So they go back and they look at the records to see who exactly was logged in when the attack occurred. There's only one professor who was logged in at the time, but he's out of the country. And according to the rest of the people in the computer lab, this one particular professor was good enough that if he was the one doing it, they wouldn't have caught him. So Cliff begins setting traps. His traps were things like making his computer go ding whenever somebody logged in so that he could run over and see who it was. And when he saw this particular professor who didn't have access to the system allegedly logging in, he could get the terminal number. Problem is the terminal number doesn't tell you where the person is calling from. So he had to set up another trap that involved hooking up an individual printer to each and every one of the 50 terminals in this lab to see who exactly was calling into the terminals and when. Eventually, he notices that this hacker really isn't spending any time in the Berkeley system. He's in there for less than a minute, typically, using it as a launching point to begin going into other systems. Cliff notices that this guy has started going into military computers and just guessing passwords is successfully gaining access to sensitive military information 10 to 20 percent of the time. So Cliff tells the military, and the military ends up getting California involved. California gets a warrant so that they can trace this. The problem is the trace goes back to Virginia, and their warrant is no good in Virginia. They try to get the FBI involved, but the FBI just, just doesn't seem to care. So Cliff decides he wants to figure out where these guys are coming from, so he starts measuring the ping, and the ping is about three seconds. So he does some math in his head, and eventually he discovers that this phone line is leading back across the Atlantic Ocean. So they've gotten it this far, and now the CIA is involved, and the CIA and the FBI do both actually care now. But the problem is the system leads back to West Berlin, and the particular phone exchange that's being used is from the 1950s. Due to the age of the system, once the call gets that far, the only way you can trace it further is to manually go hook a machine up to every phone line individually. Now, this takes over an hour to get a trace from this point backwards, and this guy isn't spending more than a minute on the Berkeley systems because there's nothing interesting there. Stoll's having this conversation with his girlfriend, who's a law student at Berkeley, and she says, well, if there's nothing interesting on your computer, why don't you just make it look like there's something interesting on your computer? Take those memos that you get from the Department of Energy and change some of the words, you know, put, put Star Wars in it and, and biological weapons and just drop the word nuclear in there from time to time. So that's exactly what Cliff Stoll does. He takes a day and he fakes a whole bunch of very secret, very official looking government documents for his computer. And it works. The guy calls in, they get their whole system in place, they trace it, they trace it, they trace it, they get back to West Berlin, the guy's in there frantically hooking up his system to each and every one of the phone lines, and they figure out who the guy is. They get the warrants all together, they bust the place down, and it's an entire ring of computer hackers that were just worming their way into Western systems and selling the information to the KGB. The most interesting part of all of this is at the end, they make it very, very clear that the fine that these guys faced was only 25% of the money that they'd received from the KGB for this information. So I'm not sure what lesson we're supposed to be taking away from this here. Quick interjection. The reason that the penalty associated with this wasn't very steep was because the laws to prosecute this sort of crime didn't exist yet. Uh, as a matter of fact, the United States couldn't even pursue prosecution. They had to leave it all to West Germany. Anyway, there's an entire PBS Nova about this, and Cliff Stoll is delightfully eccentric. Uh, he's featured in quite a few YouTube videos uh, from Brady Heron's various channels these days. Uh, he also... 
sells Klein bottles. And when he started selling them, he was like, hey, I can get these really cheap if I buy them in massive bulk. So he built an underground storeroom that has little robots in it, little robot forklifts that drive around picking up Klein bottles for him to deliver. Uh, he's, there are a lot of great videos. Clifford Stoll on YouTube. It's always a delight to watch him.